Welcome again. My name's Han. I'm one of the pastors. Usually, ordinarily in the evening, we would be studying through 2 Timothy as we have been for the last five, six, six, Nathaniel says six weeks. Uh, tonight, we're pausing from our usual study because we've got some baptisms, as most of us probably know. Tonight, what we're going to do is we are going to look at a text where an Ethiopian fella gets baptized. Actually, uh, if you want to be pedantic about it, he's, he's not modern day, he's probably modern day Sudan, but that, that's another thing. Uh, but we're going to give a who, what, when, why, how of water baptism so that everyone, hopefully if I do my job correctly, everyone in this room will understand what is happening when we throw these girls under the water and bring them back up. So if you've got your Bible and the rule, first rule of North Cross evening service is you've got to bring your real Bible. So um, tonight we've got some people here for the first time, so we'll let you off. But if you come back, make sure you bring this. So get your Bibles out. Turn to Acts chapter 8. So Acts was written by a man named Luke. Now, who can tell me what other book in the Bible did Luke write? Bible scholars right here. <laughs> Luke wrote the gospel according to Luke and the Acts of the Apostles uh, to document history of what Jesus Christ did, who he was and what he did. And he wrote the Acts of the Apostles to document what? This, this you guys are up 2-0 this half. The Acts of the Apostles. So this is really, he's talking about the birth of the church. After Jesus Christ uh, ascended to heaven and the apostles were sent out and just what they got up to and how the modern, well, how the church started up until really, um, yeah, how we got to this, how we are here in the 21st century in New Zealand. So uh, in Acts chapter, actually, it's really interesting. I found it interesting that uh, Second Timothy was the last ever letter that Paul wrote, that, that we know of, um, as he was preparing to die. So that was like the, his ending, the end of his life. Um, Acts chapter 8 is really the genesis of Paul in this story. And not that we're going to touch on the, top, uh, the verses that relate to Paul, um, but this is when we start, Paul enters the story. So I thought it was really interesting tonight where we're going to the, the origin story, kind of. So we're in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 38. Uh, let me read follow along. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiop Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter and like a lamb before its shearers is silent. So he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation, for his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So, like I mentioned, uh, here, is, here, here is our one slide summary of the whole talk, uh, and we're just going to cover really the who, what, when, why, how of water baptism, and we'll just walk through our text to unpack it. So, I want to, to point out verses 34. 32 through 34 first. Um, basically what happens is this guy, 
He's reading from the scroll of Isaiah, or Isaiah for Americans, and, and Philip goes up to him, he's like, hey, do you understand what you're reading? He's like, I, I, I don't know what, it, someone needs to explain it to me. Like this absolute platter of evangelism. And he goes, sweet, I'll explain. And so he shares the gospel with him. He tells him, it says here uh, in verse 34, yeah, verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. Uh, It's this passage about the, the, the sheep, this lamb being led to its slaughter and whatnot. And so, um, basically, you know, this, this account doesn't tell us all the things that he said, but it says he told him the good news about Jesus. And what's this deal with the sheep being, t- like, what's Jesus got to do with the sheep and whatnot? I uh, see, in a nutshell, uh, what we understand, what we know to be true is that God created everything. Even my, even my kids know this. I asked them, what is God? And they say, God is the creator of everyone and everything. God created the world. God created the stars we see and the people in this room. And God, being infinitely glorious, deserves all the glory ever in the world. And yet, uh, we human beings decide whether by our thoughts or our decisions or our actions or whatever it might be, we decide that actually my way is better than God's way. And we're going to reject the creator and not give him the glory and honor that he is due. And I'm just going to go live my life the way I think is appropriate rather than what the creator of the universe says we should do. And so what happens is God being holy, perfect, righteous, just, he can't just let that go. We might say, oh, that's unfair, but any good judge can't just let wrongdoing slide. And so this is the, the, the problem that every single human being has. See, we might look, we might, I mean, even this half of the room, you know, we're Bible scholars, but, and we look around and we go, oh, I'm not as bad as them, and maybe we're not as bad as them, but that's a pointless comparison because God is not judging us based on how good we are compared to this lot, right? God judges us, judges us according to his perfect holy standard. And so one day, when we stand before God and we have to give an account for our lives, God's not gonna go, oh, you know, like, Clinton, you're all good because you're not as bad as Jesse. So you're, it's, it's not like that, right? We all have to give an account for our own wrongdoings before God. And, though, and so you may not be Adolf Hitler, you may not be Jesse Kargig, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> no, but that, that's the point really, isn't it? Like even whether you're closer to Jesse or closer to Adolf Hitler, it doesn't matter because we have to give an account for our lives and for our sin and our disobedience and rebellion against God. And on that day, you and I, we are stuffed because no matter how good we are and no matter how good we think we are, no matter how much money you give to the church, no matter how many times you help friends move houses or, or give to charity or whatever it might be, compared to Jesse, okay, you might look good, but compared to a holy, perfect God, we always fall short. And so every single religion in the world is, in tr- is trying in some way, shape, or form to make up for our our shortfall and go, okay, if I say my prayers seven times a day, if I do a pilgrimage to that place, if I go get, do this good thing or do that thing, oh, then I'm going to work my way up to God. It's just impossible. It's impossible. You're not going to do it. You're not going to do it because you're never going to be perfect. You're never, ever going to be perfect. And so, like I said, we're stuffed. But God, so rich in mercy and love, cares for the people that he created. And so he says, okay, Jesse cannot make her way up to me. I'm going to make my way down to Jesse. And God and Jesus Christ leaves the grandeur of heaven, comes to earth, lives as a human being, and then dies on the cross, a death that you and I should have taken. And it's not just like a, that was really painful because he was nailed, to, he was beaten and he was nailed to a cross. 
and he was taking the sin of the world upon him. I, don't even, I can't even fathom what that means or what, kind, what that kind of pain means. And he di- so he dies that death that you and I deserve. And three days later, he rises from the dead, defeating death. And he says, listen, I'm for real. I am who I said I was. I am the son of God. And anyone that wants to have their sins forgiven, because you can't work it off, no matter how hard you try, all we simply do to receive the forgiveness of sins and the righteousness of God credited to our account is to simply trust Jesus Christ. That's it. You don't need to do a pilgrimage. You don't need to face this way and do prayers or do, you don't need to do any of that. Simply trust Jesus Christ. Trust him. Receive him as your savior. And then so, for those of us who have done that, we are called Christians. And now, although we stuff up every single day, the desire of our hearts, because we have new hearts that God has given us, the desire of our hearts is to now live in, a, in obedience. So we still sin, but we don't live in it. So like whenever we encounter sin as Christians, our attitude is turn your back and run now. It's not, oh, that's juicy. Let's <laughs> give me a bit of that. It's not, I don't want any, I don't want, anything to do with that. Turn my back on that. I want, I want to face Jesus, not live in sin. Because we, we love God and we want to obey him because we've experienced his grace in our lives. To be clear, we're not trying to earn our way to God. We, we already belong to him. And so in gratitude, we live our lives in obedience because we love him. And so this is what he's explaining to him. This is what Philip is explaining to the eunuch. This is the good news about Jesus Christ, that he has come and he has taken care of our sin, and he offers us salvation. And so in, in so doing, he starts talking about baptism. And so that, you know, that's one of the questions we're answering tonight. What is baptism? It's a public, symbolic act of obedience. Baptism is a public act of being dunked into water. It is symbolic, and every Christian should do it because Jesus commands it. So in verse 36, it says, They were going along the road, and they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is some water. What prevents me from being baptized? So we can infer from that that as Philip was explaining all the stuff to him, that he explained all the details of what water baptism is. And so Philip taught him the details, and then eunuch, the eunuch is, man, that sucks for him, eh? Like, that's all he's known by. <laughs> doesn't even get a name. He says, okay, sweet, let's do it. He, he's, he hears about baptism and he says, okay, let's do it. Now, I want to be very, very clear. Very, very clear. The eunuch here at this point is not saying, okay, let's get baptized because that baptism, getting dunked in the water, because that's going to save me. That's going to forgive me of my sins. Water baptism does not save anyone. Who saves? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ and who? Jesus Christ and no one else. Jesus Christ alone. It is symbolic. So the eunuch isn't there going, oh, great, there's some water. I can finally be saved. So dunk me in there so I can be saved. No, no. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 will tell us that, no, no, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Like this is a work of God, not not. Not us, not our good works, as good as they might be. So water baptism is symbolic. And if we start, oh man, I'm going to step on some toes maybe. If we start thinking water baptism has some actual kind of efficacy, like the water itself, then I reckon we're dabbling into like magic and sorcery and superstition. Because I say all the time that water is just normal plumbing. It's, just, it's the same water that you flush. It's the same water that you drink. It's the same water that you, like, if, if a vampire walked in here right now and you splashed some of that baptism water on him, he's, it's not, he's just going to get wet. It's not going to do anything to him. It's not holy. It's just water. 
So this, there's some, the thing that's taking place, this is symbolic. There's no power in that water. So it's sy- symbolic of, of many things. We'll cover some of it tonight. First of all, it's symbolic of our union with Christ. In other words, our salvation. The moment a, someone become, becomes a Christian, they have been united to Christ. Uh, that passage up there uh, in Romans is talking about a spiritual baptism that takes place. That, is, that means that uh, uh, we, we're united to Christ when we get saved. And it's, it's, it's saying, it's symbolic of this, like, when we become a Christian, we're united to Jesus. So his death is now my death. And his resurrection to new life is my resurrection to new life. And that's why uh, that's symbolic of when we put Ariana under the water, it's saying she has died to her old life. And as she comes up out of the water, it's saying she, it's symbolic of her resurrected to new life with Jesus Christ. It's also symbolic of our being consecrated to God. Now, consecrated just means uh, being set apart for a specific purpose. So when we did the baptism class with the girls, I I tried to explain this concept by talking about wedding dresses. And I asked them, hey, do you guys have wedding dresses picked out? And um, parents, thankfully, they all said no. No. They're not getting married anytime soon. Um, but suppose, suppose Chloe has picked out a, a wedding dress and it's sitting in her closet. I, we would say that dress has been consecrated for her wedding. So it's not like, oh, okay, Max is having a 21st and Chloe's going, oh, what, what should I wear to Max's 21st? Oh, that white dress looks pretty good. I'll chuck my wedding dress on. Uh, that's not going to happen. Why? Because it's been set aside for a specific purpose. It, is set, it has been consecrated for her wedding, not Max's 21st. And so this idea of being consecrated to God means we have uh, water baptism is like a symbol of us being consecrated to God. It doesn't lapse. And so what we see here is in this passage is uh, there's this talk about circumcision and how uh, in the Old Testament, a circumcision was a sign that you belong to God's people. And that this passage here in Colossians will talk about actually uh, you've been circumcised now, not a physical procedure, but a spiritual one. And so in the Old Testament, in the way that people that were circumcised, it was a symbol and a sign of them being consecrated to God. Now it's saying, okay, like there's a spiritual baptism that has taken place, a spiritual consecration, and so now we belong to God. And so really, it's symbolic also of that new life that we now have. And this carries on the Old Testament imagery of the baptism, they called it a mikvah, which um, was symbolic of coming out into a new life. So it's also a pledge of allegiance. First Peter's gonna talk about this, that water baptism, um, particularly for the spiritual realm, it acts as a pledge of allegiance. So when, when Rebecca, uh, s- s- as Rebecca is here tonight and she says, I am a Christian, I am getting baptized, she is saying, I am putting my, my, my believing loyalty on Jesus Christ. I pledge allegiance, not to the flag, but to Jesus Christ. And it's meant to be a sign to all of us and to the spiritual world that Listen, I don't know how all that stuff works, but it's, it's saying to the demons and Satan and all of them, like, shame, you guys lost. Jesus has her. Her soul is not for sale. <laughs> it's a pledge of allegiance. And so for all those reasons, that's why it's public. You see, the eunuch, he got baptized and we read the text and we might go, what, it just sounds like it's him and Philip, but actually, no, he, he, he's a, a government official uh, traveling through deserts. He's got his posse with him. There's, there, there'll be a group of people all there. And so that's why this is a public thing. And also, um, it's also because it's a public thing, it's, it's symbolic of our entrance into the church family. So if you look at that passage in First Corinthians, um, it's gonna talk about how the church is, is like a body with many parts and you're an ear and, and you're an arm and you're a leg and you're a knee and you're a whatever. And we all different people, but we all belong to one group, one body, one community. 
So this is how it works. Every single Christian that has ever existed, um, whether right now or in the past, belongs to the church, God's church. So we're all part of the same church because we all have the same faith. But that one whole big church shows its physical expression or realization through actual real churches, right? So there's this one invisible church that every Christian in the world is a part of, but we live that out through individual local churches. And so you might be talking about Long Bay Baptist or City Impact or Windsor Park or North Coast Church or Browns Bay Presbyterian or uh, Doxa Deo or Auckland Afrikaans Church or is that what it's called? Auckland, uh, yeah. All these um, churches, we're all part of one big church, but we live that out and express that in individual local bodies. And so the moment Ruby got saved, she became a part of the, the universal church, the invisible church of every single Christian in the world. She's part of the church. But I guess what the baptism ceremony does, it's, it's kind of like the, okay, let's uh, physically show that through your membership here at this local body. And that's why we, we generally tend to do it, do our baptisms here at the church. I mean, there's no like rule about it, but we generally tend to do the baptism here at church on a Sunday service because it's, it's the official slash unofficial membership entry into the church. That's why we do it here. But ultimately, even if you, um, you know, weren't listening to any of that, it comes down really at the end of the day about obedience. Like what is, it's, what is baptism? It's obedience, obeying Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus like, commissions his disciples, go make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so even if you, we understood nothing of that, we would, if Jesus Christ is our Savior, if he is our Lord, then we would go, Jesus, I have no idea what this water has to do with anything, but you say get baptized, so I'm going to go get baptized. We've explained in the past why, like, all the Old Testament um, background to it. But if Jesus said, hey, go, go make disciples and then shave their heads and uh, tattoo Ronaldo's face on their cheek. If that's what Jesus said, then we would have been like, sweet, I'm a Christian, get the razors. Like, th that's what we're doing. Because the point is it's about obedience. Jesus says, get baptized, so we get baptized. That's, that's it. So that's what it is. And that, that kind of really leads into the why someone should be baptized. And really, it's the why and the who is Christians. If you're a Christian, you should get baptized. Every Christian who wants to obey Jesus should get baptized. So verse 36 again. Uh, we, we, we see that they were going along the road, they came to some water, and he says, see, there's water, what prevents me from getting baptized? So it, he gets saved, he sees water, and he's like, okay, let's get baptized. Jesus says, do it, so we do it. So this is why at North Cross, we don't baptize babies. Now, we've got no beef with churches that do. Um, I think that if uh, those who make the case for baptizing babies, I, I think that they have a real good, strong argument for it, I was baptized as a baby. I grew up in a Presbyterian church. So honestly, no beef, no problems. Um, but this is the reason why we don't do it here at North Cross, because we believe that water baptism is, is an act of obedience that someone who has placed their faith in Jesus Christ for themselves is saying, yep, I want to symbolize and announce my faith through this obedient action. Now, um, Look down at your Bible again and just see some of you, some of your Bibles will go from verse 36 to 38. Hands up if, that, if your Bible's doing that. Yeah, quite a few. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, um, while we're here, let's talk about it a little bit. So, uh, verse 37 Verse 37 says, 
Okay, I'll read verse 36 onwards. It goes, as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here's some water. What prevents me from getting baptized? And then verse 37, which isn't in most of our Bibles. And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, if you believe in Jesus Christ, then yeah, you can get baptized. And he replied, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And then verse 38, and he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the reason why 37 is probably just a footnote in your Bible as opposed to being in the, in the actual text itself, um, probably it was a, a scri- like a scribe, the people that were copying the Bible, and was probably a scribe's note um, to just further explain what's going on. Um, and we know this because the earliest manuscripts... So like manuscripts are copies of the original and there's like thousands and thousands of them. The earliest ones don't have verse 37. Later ones do have verse 37. So like obviously it's probably best practice to go with the earlier sources. So the earlier ones didn't have verse 37. Um, So probably somewhere along the way, some scribe was like made explanatory notes and then the next person that copied it thought it was part of the text and, and carried on. But here's what I'm saying. Let's say it's supposed to be part of the text, verse 37. If it's supposed to be part of the text, then great. Then it just proves this point that every Christian who wants to obey Jesus should get baptized. If 37 isn't meant to be in here, then it doesn't change anything. It changes nothing because you read through the rest of the Acts of the Apostles and the example that you will see is someone hears the gospel, they receive the gospel, and then what? And then they get baptized. Three nil. Come on, guys. They hear it, they believe it, and then they get baptized. So every Christian, every Christian should obey Jesus and be baptized. Not just elite Christians, not just this half of the room, but every Christian should be getting baptized because it is a command from Jesus. Jesus. And that kind of answers the next question of like, when should someone get baptized? Uh, Look, there's no rule on this. In the early church, they did it differently. Sometimes they would have to wait years and do heaps of discipleship before they go, yep, you've proven to be a Christian, you can get baptized. There's There's no rule around it. The only rule is you should do it after you become a Christian. After you become a Christian. And so you might be sitting there and you're a Christian and you're like, oh man, I, I should get baptized. But you're like, hmm, I'm not gonna get baptized anytime soon because, because Auntie Yolanda is in South Africa and she's gonna fly over next year. So I wanna do it when she flies in. Like, cool, that's fine, that's fine. But the point is, we shouldn't not want to be baptized. Like, we should get baptized sometime after we become a Christian. Final one is how. How should we get baptized? Who, what, when, why, how? How do we get baptized? Well, we believe that water baptism should be done via full immersion. So that is, you, you, we fully immerse the person into the water. There's a, there's a few reasons, and people, Christians disagree with, on this. And um, if you were here last week, we looked at kind of like um, what constitutes false teaching and what's just opinions and whatnot. Uh, this is one of the th- ones that, like, if another Christian has thinks differently about this, it's okay. You can still be best friends. Uh, th- this is not something to, to fight over. Uh, so, some Christians say you, it's not about, you know, dunking them into water, but you can sprinkle water on their head. Cool. They have good arguments for that. Um, we believe that bapt- water baptism should be done by fully immersing the person into the water, um, because if you look at verse 38, so th- these are just suggestions. This is, we're making a case. He commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. So what this text is saying, and I know, um, yeah, what this text is saying is that they were on the chariot, and they saw a body of water, and was like, oh, look, there's a lake, let's go in there and get baptized, as opposed to the eunuch hearing the gospel, believing the gospel, and being like, oh, sweet, I'll get my hydro flask out, and like, let's do the baptism now. You know, they, he, he waited until he found a, a body of water, and of course he would have had his water reserves with him. They're, they're traveling through the desert. 
So that seems to suggest that, that the example that we see in, the, in, in this passage anyway was they waited until they saw a body of water. Uh, also, it fits the metaphor better, doesn't it? The, of, of dying to our old way of life and being raised to new life. Um, that metaphor fits that illustration just fits better with an immersion rather than a, a, a sprinkling. And also the word itself, a baptizo, it, it means to, it means to uh, dunk or it means to, to dip or it means to uh, fully identify. So imagine, imagine um, I had a cup of water and then I like um, splashed, you know, did that to Sean and he got a bit of, water on his face, that is sprinkling. What, what that word baptize means, means to, like, means to fully identify. So the difference between like splashing that and, I don't know, getting a hose or, like, or dunking him into the water so that he's fully wet and he fully identifies with being wet. Does that make sense? That, that word baptize literally means to like fully identify. And that's why uh, when we go in there, we dunk them completely so that they're fully identified with what that baptism is trying to illustrate. So that's the who, what, when, why, how of, of baptism. And in a moment, we're going to watch a video and hear from the girls and, and hear like why they wanted to get baptized tonight. Um, but this, this is my, my, my closing thought. Um, for anyone in here who is a Christian and has not been baptized, I would say this. Stop. Get baptized. Don't wait until you're a good enough Christian because that is one of the dumbest logic. It's just dumb. Because the person getting baptized is saying, I am not good enough. I need Jesus Christ. That's why I've received his forgiveness and his salvation, and I want to express it through baptism and just tell the world through baptism to show that I am not enough. And so for us to be there going, okay, I'm gonna wait till I'm good enough to stand up there and say, I'm not good enough. It doesn't make sense. So don't worry about all of that. If you have turned away from your sin and trusted in Jesus Christ for your salvation, fantastic, let's get baptized. Come talk to us after. All right, let's watch the video. Hi, my name is Mia.